Okay, here we are for the Active Travel Newsroom. Welcome everybody, if you're watching us on uh, YouTube or Facebook or you're watching it back, you know, we did this live. It was, uh, it was all unrehearsed and we, we went for it over the next two hours. And uh, my stalwarts, my trusty colleagues, my left and right arm now, when it comes to doing these newsrooms about this kind of stuff are Anna, Sing Anna Singleton and Mel Gould from Sustrans. How are you both, you okay? Good, thank you, John. Yeah, yourself? Not too bad. There seems to be a little less pressure with this one from International Women's Day. Mm, yeah, I think once you've had a run through, a practice try, and then you, yeah, definitely feels more relaxed this time, I would say. Good. How about you, Mel? Are you looking forward to it? Yeah, really, really great. And um, yeah, I think having had, had, had a go at it once, um, hopefully it'll be super smooth. We'll be fine. We'll be fine. We'll, we'll go off on our trusty journey then. OK, so like I said, it's one o'clock um, and we've come up with this active travel newsroom. But what I'd like to do first, before we get into some of the interviews that we've done with um, teachers and, and support workers and stuff, and obviously getting you guys to comment on some of the interviews that we've done as well. I just want to find a little bit about yourselves, really, because some people might be watching this and going, oh, I've known Anna for years, or I always see her on a bike, as I always do. I always see either yourself or Mel or Nels Elston Road mm -hmm. cycling along. But they might not know maybe how you first got into cycling or how long you worked for, for Sustrans. So maybe if we start with Anna, um, so schools officer, how long have you been doing that? For? Yeah, uh, so I've been doing the, this role for 12 years. Um, before that, I worked in a different sort of environmental field to do with transport, but Prior to that, I was a physiotherapist in the NHS. So I guess my my sort of coming to active travel has always been about the health benefits more than anything. So I think that's a, it's a big thing for all of us, but it's definitely a thing for me that if we can do things to be more active, that has good impacts upon our general health. So that's kind of a, a big thing for me why I do that. Um, so yeah, I've been doing this role for 12 years. Um, and it's just, it's a great job because it's very varied. Um, I'm not the kind of person that's great to sit in front of a computer all day long. I like getting out and speaking to people. Um, and this job enables you to do that. You know, it's an active job, which is great. Um, and it's very much about doing what you're asking other people to do. Um, and that's great about Sustrans. You know, we, we do do that, um, which is very important, I think. Yeah. So there's that kind of role model role aspect to what you do every day will be different because you're going into school I'm sure teachers will tell you that as well as much as maybe yeah. that from the outside it looks like it's a formula and it's the same all this structure but every day is different and I always assumed that you come from a kind of cycling background I didn't realize there was you know physio and you so you were more interested in the active element of the active travel which is quite yeah I think so a bike's always been really important in my life um, like as a child it's what I used to do with my parents we'd go out for bike rides and then a bike started to become my transport, I guess, in my late teens, when you start to get a bit more independence. Mm. Um, and then when I moved away for university, that was my way of getting around, getting to hospital placements when I was on my course. Um, and it's, it's that freedom, isn't it? It's that first bit of freedom that I think a lot of people experience. Sadly, I think some people then drop off and look for other things like, like a car, but that never happened for me. I, I decided not to learn to drive. Um, so a bike has always been my sort of number one transport and it's been really fun actually um, I had a child about five years ago so going through that process of how do I keep cycling because I think that's quite a tricky thing as you know as you've got a little one and how do you do that but I, I think it is possible and it's nice that sort of sharing that experience as well yeah and obviously you're off to pick up your daughter at the end of the newsroom from Granby Granby school we'll be hearing from uh, yeah. uh, going down at Granby later on um, and so, yeah, I guess it's a, it's one of those ones, isn't it, where, you know, it's you, you can live all the elements of your life with a bike. It just depends how much more convenient a car appear, yeah. appears at certain times during that, doesn't it? And invariably it yeah. relates to work, doesn't it? Yeah, no, I, I think sometimes people have the image of a, of a cyclist sort of dressed in lycra and stuff, and that's not me. Um, my bike is my means of getting around. It's how I get from A to B. It's how I'm going to pick my daughter up from school later. She's going to be on the back of my bike. So we get some bits of shopping. It, you know, it doesn't have to be a, about a particular kind of image in your head of, of what someone is who rides a bike. It's massively varied. And I think that's getting better over the last sort of five, 10 years. I think people sort of maybe understanding that. Um, and I think the kind of bikes that you can buy are getting more varied and more useful for people's lives daily. Um, so I think that's definitely improving. Yeah, we're kind of challenging those stereotypes. We'll talk about the role of the media, actually, as we go throughout mm -hmm. the Active Travel Newsroom, because I think it's important. So let's have, have a chat with Mel now. So Mel, um, so how long have you worked for Sustrans and what were you doing before that? 
Well, I've, <clears throat> I've actually only been working for SUSTRAN since October 2020, so I haven't, um, I haven't yet done this role in, in what we might call ordinary times, so I'm really looking forward to seeing what that will look like, um, but I've really enjoyed um, working in a team with Anna um, and Wayne, who we'll meet later, um, and yeah, and getting to know SUSTRAND as an organisation, which I think is fantastic, and, and doing bits of work, you know, doing work with schools in, in creative ways, given that it's very difficult to do things face to face at the moment. So that's been brilliant. Um, I, my background is I'm a, I'm a trained youth worker and I'm also a trained secondary school teacher. Um, and I've also um, lived in, in different countries uh, abroad. I've lived in Nepal um, doing education work there and in Eritrea. Um, and I did actually cycle in those places, but um, that was really the first time when I lived in Eritrea. So when I was about 27, when the first time that I rode a bike as an adult. Um, so I had really learned a bit as a child. I don't think I was ever very confident. And then um, I bought a bike just before I went to Eritrea. It was the wrong sort of bike. It was, a, <laughs> it was a mountain bike, which I wanted to go on things like the Great Central Way on. And you don't need a mountain bike for that, but it was, it was fine. And then, um, and then I started to cycle regularly um, then. And my, I met my partner there and he's really uh, a cyclist. And so, um, when I came back, I, I didn't buy a car, um, uh, and uh, and then cycling became my main means of transport, as well as walking. I still love walking as well. So if it's for leisure, I'll often walk, and um, if it's because um, I've got to get somewhere fast, I'll usually use a bike, or I've also used my, I've got a, a fold-up bike, so I, I've used that in combination with a bus to get myself to Lutterworth, where I worked for a long time, and to get myself to Market Harbour on the train, where I worked for a long time as well. So. Actually, yeah, and I guess about, sorry, John. That's interesting. It's a real varied, varied background as well. Because again, I, I probably I know you as well from sort of you know the Green Light Festival and that kind of that that that, that lifestyle. That I remember that Green Light Festival at DMU in the Queen's Building, and like anyone walking past, I mean, look at all those slightly odd people talking about an alternative lifestyle, sort of you know anti oil or peak car or anything. Sort of, and now a lot of those issues they're kind of mainstream, aren't they? We're talking about them all the time we're teaching about it in schools you know it's a conversation starter not a conversation finisher now yeah that's right and so yeah so uh, side by side with my work I've, I've always been involved in the sort of environmental world and environmental campaign not always but for a long time um and um actually the first time I met a Sostrand schools officer his name was Dave Crowdsby we still work with him now um, he's not a schools officer anymore though um, was when I was teaching at Fullhurst Community College here in Leicester and I ran a Go Make a Difference club at a time when um, it, the, those conversations about the environment and about human rights as well, you know, were still not as mainstream as they perhaps are now. Um, and that, and he, he would come to our Go Make a Difference club and meet, meet our young people and talk to them about cycling. So, uh, so there's a nice little link there as well. I think that's great because, like I said, having run Citizens Eye for so many years in Leicester and they're doing things like this, it's great to be able to do and support you guys with it here at the Dot Media Centre. It's the fact that you know all of these names and you go, ah, oh, that's why you know so. That's where, yeah, I forgot about that. And, that, and the, it's one of those things. If you're interested in this, mm. um, it kind of goes through all the elements of your life, whether it's travel, whether it's work, whether it's in, interested in the environment, whether it's campaigning, you know, like you know, Leicester Friends of the Earth, for example, you know, whether you're writing for Amnesty, it's that kind of general impression that you can make a difference and do something. And I think that's really relates to what you said there about being an adult at 27, getting a bike, and it never really playing a role as a child. We've had some parents that we spoke to for the International Women's Day saying about, they'd learned as a child and then they'd got back on a bike when they saw a poster and they think, well, if I don't ride, my child won't ride. So it's whatever role that you have as a parent or is it a, as a friend or a guardian or a grandparent, it's about encouraging young people to be active and playing, playing that role. So it's fascinating. So thank you for that. I'm now going to put you both shamelessly on the spot by asking me to give me a definition of what active travel is to you. And I'll, and I'll go last. All right. Just so I, I'll put myself on the spot as well. Um, so, Anna, what is active travel to you? I guess active travel is, you know, you can break it down to the different components. So it's, you know, the different choices, the public transport, the walking, the cycling. But I think it's it's more about just considering what transport you take. You know, it's making that that sort of thought process of what's the best. You know, if I'm, if I'm traveling half a mile, 
you know, I could walk it, I could cycle it. It's that idea of, of using your yourself to get somewhere for those journeys. You know, we're not saying to everybody, you know, if you need to travel 10 miles to work and there isn't any public transport, you know, understandably a car might be the best option for you. But for some of those other journeys, to start to consider active if travel as being a, a real sort of possibility and a good possibility that makes you feel better as well. Cool. Well, you're winning the prize so far. That's good. Um, <laughs> uh, Mel, over to you. Well, what I say to children is active travel is when you use your body to get from one place to another place. Um, so active travel is anything which involves using your body instead of using a machine or using your body as part of that journey. As Anna was saying, you might walk to the bus stop and then get on the bus, for example, but you're not just sitting or just sitting um, in a car for the whole journey. So um, so that's what I would say active travel is. And, and I guess, yeah, in terms of benefits, you've got you've got the activity for your body and how much healthier that is for you. There's the, the how much healthier it is for your local environment, reducing air pollution, um, and then how much healthier it is for the planet. So it's just a triple win, really. Yeah, that's good. Well, I'm going to give you a political answer, and I'm going to say I agree with both of you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, I think my answer would be probably very different from when we got involved in doing the International Women's Day newsroom a couple of weeks ago, and now doing this one, listening to so many different people from five or six year old primary school children right through to head teachers and everybody in between it's the fact that it's it's not about being exclusive to one particular mm -hmm. mode of transport you know if walking's an option consider that you know as you said you got on a bus you took a folding bike if the car's mm -hmm. the option it was interesting to listen to the teachers saying that they deliberately cycle friday so they can't take work home or their yeah. laptop which then means they can cycle back in on on monday it's, it's, it's kind of changed yeah. it that way, isn't it? Yeah, I think we like to use labels lots, don't we? We like to say to one person, they're a, they're a cyclist, they're a walker. But mm. I'd rather say, you know, sometimes I use my bike. Sometimes I hop on a bus. You know, it doesn't need to define who we are all the time. It's just about what choice is best at that particular time. Um, so that's, that's been great to have those conversations with lots of different people. And, and that's kept coming up time and time again. Yeah, sure. brilliant. Well, listen, guys, I think we'll dive into it now. That's great. I just wanted to set the scene so people knew why we were having this active travel newsroom, really, and, you know, where, where the idea had come from to just do something, maybe look at it slightly differently. And what we've got with the format is we've got um, some um, teachers and workers at schools that we've spoken to over the last couple of weeks, which has been really interesting. And we've got full interviews with them that are on YouTube, and they'll be posted now while we're talking. The whole interview will go up onto onto the Facebook page and all the various links. But what we're gonna do, I'm gonna pick out some clips um, of uh, these people talking, yeah? And then what we'll do is we'll talk around the clips and um, get, maybe get behind it. I've got a few questions to ask you and any observations and stuff. Um, now, what people will know is when they watch the whole video uh, on YouTube is you guys are in various, various versions of them and it, as is Wayne, who'll be joining us later, I've not played those clips because it'll be, so Anna, how did you think you did there? You know what I mean? <laughs> Comment on what you said. I'm not going to do yeah, that. Yeah, be a bit awkward that, couldn't it? <laughs> would you mark yourself out of 10? You <laughs> okay, so what I'll do is I'll ask you, Anna, because you were involved in this one. Um, we're going to speak to or listen to Jason mm. Taylor now down at Catherine Junior School. Mm. Um, just tell us a little bit about, um, Jason, your involvement now and how you were interested in getting them involved in, in the mm. new yeah, so Catherine Junior School is up in, in Belgrave. Um, it's a junior school, so sort of ages seven up to 11. It's quite a big school. Um, it's a very get stuck in school. It's a very lively school, very keen on taking part in different activities. Um, so when we contacted the school about having a, a clean air day, um, they were just so excited. And I think that's when you first talk to a school and you say, how about shutting the, the road to traffic for a day? You know, some schools will go, oh, I don't know about that. But they were just so positive. And, and Jason, for me, sets the tone in that school. You know, he's, he's Mr. Positive. He's Mr. Coming up with different ideas all the time. And I think that will shine through in the interviews that, that we show now. Yeah, excellent. And his role is quite interesting as well, isn't it? Because it's kind of like mental health, support, well-being yeah. kind of role as well. Yeah, sort of learning mentor. Um, so yeah, he gets to meet lots of the pupils in his school. He gets to do quite a lot of sort of enrichment and, and obviously talking with families and seeing if he can help families with the child's education. And um, so yeah, very sort of holistic way of, of, of being a teacher, I guess. Yeah, I should have a chat with my university students about 
is Jason Taylor an influencer? That would be quite interesting. Mm. You know, yeah, yeah. I love those kind of conversations. Right, let's, so let's dip in and have a, have a look at um, Jason. I'm going to share my screen now. Um, so let's get a YouTube channel up. And we'll expand the screen. All starting with something that we did called Clean Air, Clean Air Day. Uh, and basically, with the strands, with the help of Leicester City Council, uh, we decided that we wanted to really reinforce active travel by scooting, walking, cycling to work. Uh, and making sure that um, sort of the children knew the benefits of, of having a, a clean air day and thereafter sort of walking school, cycling to school. Uh, so we decided that we would close off completely the roads, uh, which is basically our neighbour. We, we step out onto that road and it's, it's quite a rat race on from Melton Road and to Catherine Street. So we are that shortcut, uh, which annoyed quite a few people. But unfortunately, um, we had to do that to make sure that we had a safe environment. Um, so we made the road a learning environment for the children. So for the whole day, there were hopscots, there were um, suscans putting on activities. We had our PE team going out there for, um, having cricket. So that's basically how the idea sort of came about, um, is that we would really enforce this with our children and their parents, which was really, really great. It was really welcomed by our neighbours across the road as well, because there's a large couple of terrace houses. Um, so we were really quite pleased with the response we got from our neighbours. Um, so pleased that we're actually having a meeting today with the Strands about putting on our next Clean Air Day, which will hopefully be in June this year. Um, with regards to myself, um, I'd like... That was really interesting, listening to, um, to Jason there, because it's taking the neighbours. I've got the I've got this vision of taking the neighbours on that journey and then being delighted that the traffic was stopped as well. It was a really interesting conversation with him, wasn't it, Anna? Yeah, it really was. That was such a, a fabulous day to be able to to join the school with the surrounding streets to put something on that benefits both sets of people and actually have the the residents coming out and engaging with the school was lovely. Um, so we, I think we talked at one point that there was a a couple of households that came out onto the street with their young children, toddlers, and, and some babies in like one of those bouncers. And they just came out onto the street because they got sunshine. So in the backyards, the sun wouldn't go into the backyard, but they just wanted to, to come out and experience that. And that was a, one of my sort of favorite moments from that entire day, actually just seeing that and seeing sort of the delight of the little toddlers running up and down the road safely. And it just shows what, what we can potentially do um, with space out, you know, in our city. Yeah. Now, when we talk later on to uh, Natalie Sutton at Sandfield um, Close Primary School as well, they've got a, uh, an active street closure outside as well. Are you finding that across the schools that you're working with in the city that quite a lot of them have gone for street closures, um, either for events or throughout lockdown? Yeah, definitely. It was um, all sort of brought about with a project called Return to Schools just before September, thinking about how can we make it a safer pupils returning to school um, in terms of road safety, but also allowing a bit of space for social distancing. And some schools, it's a real struggle. You know, there might be a little cul-de-sac leading to one school or even two schools. And, and, and what do you do when the pavement's fairly small? How can you enable people to have that, that safe space? Um, which is where we looked at the road closures and I think they're doing really well. We've got more schools looking to come on this year as well. Um, and, you know, I think people get used to them in terms of drivers. They understand what we're trying to do. And if that means they have to park a little bit further and, you know, the, the kind of the, the, the buy in is that they when the child leaves the school, they've got space to socially distance and just relax a little bit. It's not as much tension when you come out of the school gates. I know with my own daughter onto Elston Road, I'd always rather go the back way where it's quieter and calmer than out onto a main road. So enabling people to have that space, I think, is really important. Mel, just bringing you in here on that kind of wider environmental issue, really, we're talking about, you know, street closures or just outside schools, you know, we've had quite a lot of um, uh, lanes re um, closed off and turned into cycling for key workers and stuff that seems to have been quite a success and got Leicester quite a lot of national coverage at the start. <coughs> Walking in every day now, as I do from Alston, traffic levels at certain times seem to, well, the perception is they've gone back to to pre-COVID levels, but the chances are that they haven't. Um, from your from your um, experience and your own knowledge of, of, of this area and cycling around there, are, are we getting 
traffic is it returning to its normal level or do you think there's still people that are walking and cycling and using those alternatives rather than just jumping straight back because certainly a lot of buses seem to be quite empty at certain times so, so I have read some things and I'm going to now not have the statistics to my fingertips. I feel like I've read that the, the figure of 28%, which is people who started cycling that weren't cycling before. Um, and I think there's a greater, a greater number, maybe 50% of walkers. It may not be that exact statistic with that exact thing, but there has been an increase in cycling and walking um, during, during the COVID period. Um, I think you've got the simultaneously, like you say, drop off in the use of public transport. And so what, what overall might happen is that it looks in terms of the traffic and it can look the same as well. Um, so yeah, so, so, so it's, a mixed, it's a mixed picture. And for some people who might have been doing a more active journey, they may now be doing a less active journey in a car or where they might have been car sharing, they may no longer be car sharing. And at the same time, you've got more people taking journeys by, by walking and cycling. And especially because, as you said, there's, there's a lot more infrastructure now that supports that. Um, I've done, I've t I, I normally avoid the sort of the arterial routes and the big, the big roads, but I've recently been, you know, deliberately going down them to see what it's like as a cyclist now with the new paths. And it really does make a difference. In fact, I cycled to the station. I normally cycle a very roundabout way to the station to try and avoid um, the traffic, but now using the new routes, um, I've got a, a full train before I needed to get my train um, beforehand. So, um, so it really does, you know, it can make a difference having this infrastructure in. And we, yeah, we really obviously, I think with a heightened awareness about the climate emergency as well, there's a hope that people will, will match up, you know, their, their aspirations about helping to deal with that together with their own concerns about their own health, um, because obviously a lot of people have been less active being at home during this period as well. So hopefully people see those opportunities to be active, to get their bodies active and they'll use, they'll use those things more. Yeah, that's a really interesting point you make there about getting to the station quicker, because I guess the, the thing with the, using a bus, wasn't it, is always it's not a direct route for me. I've got to use two buses, so therefore I use my cars, that kind of chicken and the egg. You know, how, how does it work? And I guess with cyclists as well, you've got used to, um, changing your own behaviour to go a route that maybe you felt the perception was it was safer for you, even though it took longer. Now, suddenly, you know, you've got the ability to be treated the same as another road user by having your transport accommodated on the main arterial routes, which is not something that was normally happening. So it's really interesting that those kind of conversations we need to be having more, isn't it? As we make those changes, people will use it because pan the pandemic's been habit changing. You know, it's, it's gone on long enough now, a year. How many times do you have to do something before you can get out of the habit? I mean, a year is a long time, isn't it, to um, moderate or change behaviour or, or try something different and think, well, actually, this is quite cool. I might carry on quite, quite, quite doing this. Yeah, and I, I don't know if Anna's noticed this, but I really have noticed how many really young children are out on their bikes. No, not on stabilisers, not on balance bikes, but actually cycling confidently on their bikes. And I don't know, Anna, if you think that's been an increase, but it seems like it to me. I think it really has, yeah, particularly sort of on our traffic-free routes that we have, that there's lots of young children out there. And I, I wonder, because of sort of the last year, families maybe had a little bit more time to to do that to get out and on the bikes and I think more children are, are learning how to ride perhaps at a younger age because of balanced bikes um but I think yeah there's definitely an increase you just need to go out sort of Elston Meadows and it, it's it's fab it's so lovely to see and I, I really really do hope it continues yeah. excellent right okay so that's that's our first part clean air day so I want to move on to uh, Jason shared a very personal story with us um which I thought was interesting because it just shows you the impact that maybe you know something like a tragedy can have on changing your life and then maybe all aspects of your life that you wouldn't normally wouldn't normally consider so let me let me tee tee this one up there we go and we're back to the same thing that we were looking at before right, so sort of kind of say thank you but also sort of blame anna definitely and also the sustance team for my personal growth um because I didn't think that I would be cycling 14 miles a day to work 
one day a week, let alone three days, which is what I've built up to now, even in the winter and the dark long days. Um, so thank you to Anna, thank you to Sir for sort of making that possible for me. Um, Anna will sort of know that a testimonial to herself and the team, um, she asked me to write something for the school, so just her team meeting, uh, and unbeknown to I, that I actually brought the majority of the team to tears. Um, I had a bereavement, my brother passed, um, and it was during sort of that time that I bought a second-hand bike, and this was just, you know, after the clean air day. Um, and I spent that time sort of reflecting on my brother's life, doing a little bit of maintenance. And now I feel that sort of my brother is with me because I've got that connection for my bike and sort of wrote a testimonial to Anna and the team. Uh, and apparently it was quite a moving team meeting, was it, Anna? Incredibly moving. Yeah. When someone is that open and shares something like that with you and then also gives you the go ahead to then share it to your colleagues is is very overwhelming. Yeah. And there was a, a room of teary Sustrans officers for sure. Um, some of the other skills that sort of, uh, I've learned and sort of been, been using is sort of bike maintenance as well. So my partner sort of pointed out to me, although I've got a, a car sit, a brand new car sitting in the driveway, which I don't use anymore, <laughs> um, it's really important to sort of build up that maintenance and pointed out that, you know, if my car would need service at least once a year, then my bike would need quite a few. Didn't quite realise that, so I've had to hone up on my skills and also have the backup of Sir Strands and uh, Chris Dr. Bike who is always there for me, you know, I can always bring them up and say, I've got this problem, I've just come to work today, help. Uh, and Anna, Sir Strands and Dr. White are always there saying, okay, let's just have a, a quick look at it, or let's see what we can do, or tell me a bit more about it. So that's really good, it's another skill I've learned. And also, through Anna and Sir Strands, I've actually got a brand new bike uh, a couple of years ago as well, after the Clean Air Day, then I decided to sort of not go on holiday, so again, not using any sort of transport, but also using that money to actually buy a brand new bike as well. So uh, thank you, Anna, for all of those things. I could listen to Jason all day talking. Actually, mm -hmm. I think he's a great he's a great motivator as well. And um, we were talking, weren't we, about you know how we could do more with him to get him in front of other schools to help mm -hmm. teachers that feel they needed to influence their maybe their management team or their or their yeah. trust and stuff. Really yeah, I just want to there, Anna. Can I say that again, John? Really interesting story that he shared. There. It is a very interesting story. Yeah, yeah. And it just shows, doesn't it, how you know, things happen in our lives and sometimes having that space and time and just to, to think about things, to process things is is really valuable. And kind of that that, that fitted really beautifully with, with him cycling. Um, but yeah, Jason is an individual. He's he's fantastic. He really is, you know, to, to that school. To get to know him as a sort of colleague and a friend has been amazing over the last couple of years um, and the energy that he brings. And uh, it's funny, this this week he's been talking to another member of staff at the school who wants to start cycling. Um, and he's kind of put us together and started those conversations. So it's kind of that drip effect, isn't it? So one person does it and then another member of staff sees, it. oh, yeah, Jason's doing it. Oh, maybe I could do it. So it's kind of it's snowballing, which is great. Yeah, that fits perfectly with the next clip, actually, what we've got of him, because he was talking about um, things like impact um, that you can have as a teacher and again that's something that's come out with we're talking to quite a lot of the other um, teachers and deputy head teachers and head teachers and you know learning support assistants throughout this time and even parents to an extent isn't it that parents seeing you bringing your child to school on a bike yourself not just the child on the bike but you on a bike as well um, as I'm sure as I'm sure you do Anna it's, it's a really um, a different way of of, of doing isn't it so let's talk, listen to this part as well from Jason about an um, impact and also the wider impact when it comes to mental health and I'll pick pick this up with both of you when we when we come back I think you have on on the children when they see you making these kind of lifestyle decisions really I guess um so I'm, I'm actually known for cycling in um I was just um, I also do counseling in school and I was talking to um, a student yesterday who through the pandemic has sort of got anxiety about coming to school and I sort of honed in that it was actually the walk to school with her dad that was the biggest problem, getting out that door and then walking to school. So we talked about sort of different things and different ways that you could walk to school, um, walking with another parent, walking with the two dads walking together. And we looked at sort of the, the fact that she'd got a scooter and she'd got a bike. Uh, and today she sort of saw my bike in, in this bright, quite new bike shed that we've got. And I was like, I can do it. And I live, you know, seven miles away. 
you can do that one day. And so I spoke to parents last night and it really made a positive impact. As in, she's now not thinking about walking out that door and dreading coming to school. It's, oh, today I'm going to do my bike, tomorrow I'm walking with my friend's father, you know, the next day I'm using my scooter and I can lock it up. Um, we were talking about how safe her bike was because I've got a, a lock on mine, the bike shed's locked up and then the gates are locked up. So it's like triple locked, basically. If someone's going to steal a bike or a scooter, then they'd have to get past the security cameras and three different locks. So it was just having that positive impact on that particular child. I thought what was quite interesting about that as well is if you can get past the security cameras, the, the, the three locks and the gate, by that time, I should imagine Jason would have arrived and you'll just put the bike back. <laughs> and, and Mel, just bringing you in here as well about the impact of things like, you know, mental health and anxiety during, during, during the pandemic. I mean, there's, there's the positives, isn't there, of being out and traveling on your bike or walking or scooting, just being, just being outside. I know certainly this morning talking to my students with one-to-ones, coming up ready for their sort of, you know, final deadlines. There's a lot of them are starting to see the walls move in after a year of, you know, blended learning and, you know, only seeing me online, if you like. And um, I think it's, it's really important, the important, important aspects of being out, isn't it, on, on your wellbeing? Absolutely, yeah. And I suppose if you think about some of the things that come up when you think about, you know, when I think about cycling, I think about fresh air, I think about, I often, as I said, choose quieter routes. So there might be peacefulness, I might observe something in nature, I might hear some birds singing. Um, I almost always meet somebody that I either know or that will smile at me on the way. Um, and, you know, similarly, if I'm, I'm walking, I'm sure it'd be the same if I was scooting, although I'm not an expert on that. Um, and, and then I suppose I think about, oh, well, what's, what's the image that comes to mind if, if from driving and I only drove for a very short amount of time but what comes to mind is traffic jams, uh, road rage <laughs> um, and lots of things that are perhaps not so good on, on your mental health um, and that's not to say it's completely binary and I'm sure some people find, um, find driving relaxing and you know especially if you look at the adverts where there's this um, fabled roads with no cars on um, it would be lovely and relaxing but but generally speaking, I think, you know, any form of active, when you're active, we already know that activity is good for your mental health and well-being. And then you add to that being outdoors, breathing the air, you know, being nearer to nature and the sociability of just smiling at people. You know, there's no glass in between you and being able to say hi to people when you, when you see them in the street. That kind of broader environmental environmental issues as well I think about traveling on the bus as well you know sort of wearing a mask and you know the kind of all the sort of the, the less has been of, of that over the winter I think you know there's less colds or the, the common cold has gone because we obviously we're all wearing masks now and probably doing things that my Chinese students have been doing for a long time you know I've been teaching there for five years at DMU and the whole time my students have been wearing masks so when they've been walking around it's one of those things it's looking at I guess as as well opportunities for people to get involved isn't it i know we've had sky ride in the city and you know city ride and you know whatever you know, hopefully we'll have something this year it will be at the right time in august i mean anna do you think these mass participation rides make a really big difference they connect together the work that schools are doing around bikeability and encouraging parents to go out and kind of you know cycle around venues that they know like you know cycling through the city ground and you know past yeah. the clock tower and stuff yeah, I think, you know, the best way I think is a mix, mixed approach. You know, those those big events are great because they get a lot of publicity. There's a the sort of publicity beforehand and then sort of lots afterwards too. And it often gets on sort of local media. Um, you know, it's a, it's a fab day out. It's a, a chance to go and see your city in a different way. And all the entertainment that comes along with that is lovely. I think lots of the, the events where we take out sort of, we call them community park events. We take a little road show out and put it into a park, into a neighbourhood. I think they're fab you know in the summer holidays we do lots of those so people living nearby can come bring a bike have a bike check they can go on some of our bikes they can chat to us about routes so I think it's yeah those big events are fab because they're you know they're in your face and, and people see them and go out and enjoy them but I think it's also about that regular sort of contact be it in the communities or schools or workplaces so I think that mixed approach will always be be better for more people yeah that kind of regular being seen yeah. and then something big that maybe people 
yeah. you your local road shows can participate in. And yeah, I think those um, key worker corridors that we mentioned earlier are great too because they're very visible because they're on the main roads where people are traveling and moving around. I think maybe in the past a lot of, of cycle infrastructure has been tucked away and like little back streets and little paths and stuff like that, which for some people is great. But for other people who maybe just want to get to a destination quickly, so it could be the train station like Mel was mentioning earlier, you want a direct route and you want to see that direct route and you maybe watch other people using it. And you know, once you've seen other people cycling along, they're thinking, oh, you know, that could get me to where I need to go as well. So um, that visibility is key. Um, and I think, you know, that's happening more and more with the infrastructure, with the events, with the community events, the schools, the workplaces, hopefully recovering lots of people. Yeah. Okay. Now, so Mel, I'll bring you in now on the, um, on the big pedal. So let me, let me share the, share the, um, share the screen. Cause I've got the website here. It's got to be the funkiest and coolest um, uh, logo I've seen at the top of a website for a long time. I think that's quite cool actually. Um, I'd love to know who actually designed that. That's pretty cool. Um, now this is something that schools can sign up, sign up for. Is that right? Yeah. 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 That's right. Any school can sign up for the big pedal and it's really flexible. Um, how they want to be engaged. Um, so um, they can they can sign up for the whole two weeks um, and then um, they get counted for up to five days um, and they get put into all sorts of interesting um, prize draws and things like that. And so I'm a bit more knowledgeable about locally, locally. I know that we can offer certain things um, to them. So myself and Anna, are, um, are offering a, a sort of an outdoor session in the summer term, which could be a balanced bike session or a, um, uh, uh, for some people it might even be a lead ride. Um, uh, and, um, and there's also the chance to win uh, the a stunt rider come and do a playground um, activity, a, a sort of stunt show. So that's all available. And um, I'll pass over to Anna to talk a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, so it's a, a national competition. Um, I think we've gone over a thousand schools that have now oh. registered, I think. Yeah, yep. five, five, more, five more have registered since we started. <laughs> um, so again, you know, we were talking earlier about how do we to keep that kind of idea of active travel in people's minds. And this is one of those tools that we use, you know, we're saying to schools, why not, you know, use this time period. It's springtime, the weather's getting better. Maybe people are thinking about being a bit more active in the way that they travel to school. Um, and it's really flexible, so it's not just cycling, it's walking, it's scooting, it's wheeling, um, being active, getting to school. Um, so we've got, I think, 10 schools at the moment in Leicester signed up. We'd love to get some more joining. And as Mel said, it's super flexible. You could do the, the whole time. You could pick one day and just give one day a go. Um, but it's, it's all sort of starting to have those conversations about why it's so good. You know, children arriving to school, more awake, more fresh, more ready to learn is, is a great thing. You know, the, all the different health benefits, less cars around the school means better air quality. So, you know, there, there's so many benefits to schools and we're, we're here to help and support as much as we possibly can. Brilliant. So anyone is interested, the, the website is the big pedal or big pedal, not the big pedal, bigpedal.org. UK. Like I said, five schools added from when I looked at it earlier. Yeah. Um, so that's quite good. It's obviously one of those things that's um, getting bigger and bigger and uh, excellent as well. All power to Sus Transit's elbow for, for that one. So we're going to move on to our second school now, which is Samfield Close Primary. And we caught up with Natalie. And what was really interesting about talking to Natalie Sutton is she's the business schools manager or the school's business manager. So not a teacher, you know, not a governor or whatever, but someone who actually looks at the school uh, when it comes to the way it operates, I guess, you know what I mean? Probably one of those unsung heroes behind it that people are unaware of that keep all the wheels, keep all the wheels moving and the bins emptied and lunch arriving the day before in the back of a lorry. So it was, it was interesting catching up with her and we're gonna to talk to her specifically about two things. One is schools ride um, and uh, parents as well, that, you know, as a reward for bikeability. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna, she's gonna to touch on the environment. So I'll come back to you about that. So let's listen to her talking about the schools ride section first. Well, like it was, um, it was cycling proficiency then. And you got your little badge that you put on the front of your chopper, and now you've got bike ability and stuff. But in Leicester, you've actually got this schools ride, isn't it? So, I mean, Natalie, you guys have participated in that right from the very beginning, you were saying. Yeah, so since it started, uh, we were invited 
Um, and I think it was back when, when me and Wayne were together doing the uh, such trans. And uh, yeah, it, w it was a, a little bit of a, um, oh my God, are we going to manage to get all the children down to the cathedral and back again, in, you know, in one piece? But it's been fantastic. Every year the children have looked forward to it. So what we've done is we've linked it into our cycle training. So it's a reward for them to sort of showcase um, their achievement of passing their, their level two bikeability. So there's been a real strong link with such trans and bikeability really with the school since day one. Um, but yeah, it's really, we really look forward to it. Um, yeah, we've got a lot of members of staff that give up their days off um, to help us take the children. We've had lots of parents and grandparents in the past um, that have actually given up their time to help us. And it's amazing. There's such a good atmosphere, isn't there, Wayne? There's a real good vibe. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. we love it. Well, it. And the sun always normally shines for us, which is even better. Um, but yeah, it's a shame that we missed out on um, 2020 and it looks like we're going to miss out on 2021. But hopefully we'll come back again um, in 22 and, you know, and it'll be as fantastic as ever. Uh, Wayne, we were talking to Anna and, and Mel um, uh, during the last couple of recordings that we've done. And it, I, I was saying it's interesting, isn't it? When you've got all these young people you see, it's amazing when you see it in, in Leicester. If you're not expecting it as well, they all come past. And it's just like, where are all these kids coming from and where are they all going? And what are they doing? Um, it, it, it's an impressive sight to see, having filmed a few of them as well, is that what we need to take, when we take one step back, you think about every child that's there, it's a reward for them, as Natalie said, for passing a particular level. But also, you've had the parents have given permission for something to, for that to happen. And so really, it's that taking everybody on that journey, isn't it? It's making parents believe as well that the roads are safe or safer for their kids to get involved and, and getting them to support the kind of our active travel campaigns and stuff that we have. Absolutely, and, and, and it's not a short ride. From Sandfield Place to the city centre, it's not really a short ride. It, you know, probably the furthest school out. Um, and there is infrastructure to get there, pretty much traffic free all the way. And just by exploring that with, with the kids when, when they're 10, 11 years old and getting them out there, showing them the possibility that a bike will give them. And if they can do that when they go to secondary school and a bit further, it just means they can go to additional uh, colleges, additional schools and things like that when, when they get older and it just yeah, creates a, a That was great listening to um, to Natalie there talking about the impact of you know something like the schools right as, as a reward for the young people as well when they've done that and then just kind of just touching base with Wayne there about um, you know parents and stuff because that's a really interesting thing isn't it um, and I will bring you in here you know getting getting parents involved in some of this stuff as well is really, really important. Definitely, yeah, yeah. It's always lovely to see uh, parents coming along and, and supporting the ride. Um, but also, you know, you, you hear sort of afterwards the children talking to the parents about where they've been. And we, uh, we often try and supply like a little route card for the child to take home. So they've got a description of how they've got into the city centre and how they've got back out. And it's, again, it's the idea of maybe seeing your city in a different way, that there's, there are different places you can ride and that can get you to places. You know, and, and that is a good length ride from Sunfield to the cathedral. So I'm, I'm always really chuffed when you see the kids sort of arrive back with still big smiles on their faces. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a shame. Maybe it won't happen this year in the same format, um, but we're trying to work out sort of different ways of doing it. But when we can, it'll be such a fun, happy day when we can get back to doing that. Yeah. Excellent. So what we'll do now is we'll, we'll, we'll play, I'll play the next clip. Um, and this is where... Um, Natalie was talking about the environment um, specifically. Uh, let's find it here. So, you know, I know science and stuff with Sarah and eco schools and everything like that. And you've also done some work with. Danny, I think, from the City Council, the Air Quality Education Officer and stuff. How important do you think it is that you, you, you get, the, get the children thinking about not only being active, but about the environment and, and those kind of things? Well, it's, it's really important. And by having Danny coming into school, as well as weighing in bikeability, really makes the children think about their local environment and the impact that they have. I know that we had Danny in 
um, in, in probably 2019 um, to do with the, the air quality. We had lots of workshops and things. And she actually walked around the school site and took samples off the trees just to analyse the air quality within the area. And we were quite lucky that we managed to get in involved with a project with the University of Leicester that Sarah um, got us involved with. And we actually had a sensor that was put on the school site um, and we monitored the air pollution around the school. And it was at a time where there was quite a lot of um, pollination um, due to the weather. Um, and it was so interesting. The children were so interested. And then in turn, that led to a vested interest about the, the atmosphere around them, the environment and the consequences of, you know, not idling outside with the cars, with the parents, um, trying to um, consider coming in on the bikes or parking and striding. Um, they're very, very aware of, um, of things like that our children are. And we're so, so lucky that, you know, that we've had um, the likes of Danny come in and, and Wayne to really, really like open the, the, their minds to it. And then obviously with how great Sarah is with, you know, promoting the environmental issues within school and with us being an eco school. But yeah, they're very, very aware of the local surroundings our children are. And it's fantastic because they'll take that with them as they grow up into adults and hopefully continue to have that understanding of their environment. So we've been joined by Wayne now. So uh, Wayne, thanks for, uh, for joining us here at the Active Travel Newsroom. Um, it was really interesting talking to Natalie, wasn't it, when we spoke to her last week, because she mentioned about some of the work that you've done down there as well. But also it was, I thought, very insightful as a, a school's business manager to be thinking about the, not only just the kind of the day-to-day -day operations of the school, but the impact that you're having on children long-term when it comes to learning some of these some of these things. It's, it, it was an interesting conversation, wasn't it? Absolutely. It's all, yeah, it's all, always been interesting uh, since I first started working with Samfield Close. And that is because of um, Nat, uh, Natalie, and she mentioned Sarah, and there's also Amanda, the head teacher. The way they, they approach it, they, it's not just looking at the day-to-day -day stuff, what they've got to do in the classroom. It's about understanding that wider impact of what they do and what's outside and how that can affect the children's education. And, they just, they just build it in so well. We're, we're the same with a lot of our schools, and we, we do see the schools that are leading on this. It's It comes from that point where they're listening to the children and they're combining the, the whole aspects of, of the education and what we do, the active travel, but with what they're doing with the air quality, with damage, they say as well. So, so, so Wayne, tell us, what, what's, your, um, what's your job title? So my job title is Delivery Coordinator for the East Midlands for Sustrand. Okay, so that so Leicester's one of your delivery areas. What what other yeah. areas will you be talking about? Other cities? So I manage projects in in Leicester. There's two in Leicester. The schools one, which uh, Anna and Mel uh, work on. We've got well, we did have a workplaces project that's been very different this last year. So we've got workplaces officer and community stuff. He's been working behind the scenes on a lot of stuff supporting Leicester City. But in other areas, we've got job seekers. Uh, where we look after uh, support job seekers are getting back into work we've got workplaces community projects we've got schools projects in Nottingham as well um, and we haven't had one for a year or so but in Lincoln we've, we've got a project just starting again in Lincoln it's had been a year or so off because of funding changes but uh, yeah starting in April there's going to be another schools project very similar to what Anna and Mel are doing here. And, and, and from a, a, a sort of a, a known perspective you know what i mean do, do, you, do you think what's the what's the general public's awareness do you think of of sus trends maybe as an organization or do you think they exist but they think it does something specific rather than some of the things that you just spoke about i think the knowledge of sus trends is, that, that's a bit of a challenge i think for us as an organization we've done a lot of research actually and the feedback we get is that people are aware of are, they do know of sus trends a lot of people do know of it they don't always know what we do. If you ask somebody if they have heard of the National Cycle Network, the results of that are always a lot, lot higher. And when we explain to them that uh, Sustrans came from the start of the National Cycle Network 40 odd years ago, and we're sort of the custodians of it. We don't own all the land. It's, uh, it's owned by different uh, people and, and different councils, different landowners. But yeah, we, we really do look after it. We advocate for it. We uh, really are pushing to make sure it's, uh, uh, yeah, an equal 
transport option uh, is the same as roads and trains and things like that because there are so many people that rely on bike and and on foot uh, to and wheelchairs users all sorts and even in lots of areas around the country people on horses use it to get from A to B so for leisure and for work and what was your sort of pre such trends employment career so before Sustrans actually worked for a sustainable transport organisation in Nottingham called, uh, well, known as RideWise, um, doing, I was a marketing and uh, community organisation, doing events, raising tra- uh, awareness about active travel. And um, we now work really closely with them in Nottingham, on our Nottingham project, which is fantastic. Uh, before that, I'd worked with, uh, in a charity, so just going back 10 years or so, uh, for housing a charity uh, helping homeless people and people at risk of homelessness uh, so in in Loughborough. yeah okay and, that, and obviously the got the reason i'm asking you that Wayne, is because i kind of pressed i'd pressed mel and anna at the beginning about um you know some of their pre stuff now i'm going to ask each of you a question and then there's a reason behind it okay so uh, mel i want to know what did you want to do when you were about 14 or 15 oh my goodness when i was 14 or 15 that's a tricky one. I'm not sure I know. I know when I was very small, I wanted to be a clown, which I think I've achieved in many different ways, but maybe not in the way I imagined. You just made me laugh. So, yeah, that's good. We're on our way. So, Anna, how about you? I, I wanted to be a doctor. A doctor. Okay. <laughs> physio. physio. You can kind of see the segue there. So, okay, we're getting yeah, close. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, if I was honest, there's still a little bit of me that like to, to do that. And, you know, I watch the TV programmes and imagine that I am one from time to time. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's always been that, yeah, yeah always been that kind of health focus for me, I suppose. Yeah. And Wayne, when you were sort of 14, 15, young man, what, what kind of things were you thinking about? Um, it, well, then just a yeah, professional sports player is where I was wanting to go, uh, get involved in sport, that kind of thing. Before that, though, which was probably the best thing I remember, the reason I smiled when you asked the question, when I was at primary school, I wanted to be a stuntman. And I remember drawing in my book, a picture of me jumping on a bike onto a lorry. So yeah, it probably was there all along that I wanted to work with bikes. Yeah, and what I love is when you talk to people about that kind of stuff, first of all, everyone chuckles. Yeah, then they, you can see them reaching back, you know, kind of um, thinking back to a particular time. But there isn't a a serious question. I mean, obviously, you know, teaching at the university, I'm teaching on a creative media entrepreneurship module. So we're talking to them about what they want to do when they leave uni, graduate, work for themselves, be a freelancer, et cetera. And my partner, Tina, said, you know, showed us something found on Facebook earlier about, you know, the top 10 jobs that children want to do. And obviously there was, you know, a YouTuber at the top. I think then it was like a a vlogger and a blogger. And then I think it was um, a musician. And then he got into filmmaker and stuff, you know, went all the way, all the actor, you know, that kind of stuff that you would expect them to, to say. But what, what, what's really interesting at the moment is we are in that transitional time now with, you know, government investment, you know, uh, profile raising from, you know, young, young women like, you know, Greta Thunberg through to, you know, David Attenborough's role, I guess, as almost as a custodian of the earth for everybody in Leicester and beyond, that we're employability when it comes to green issues and sustainability sector and stuff is a real issue and how do we get working the kind of roles that you guys do it doesn't matter whatever your route is you know whether it's through working overseas I guess there's a link there with 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 Mel and the environment and international development you know from being a a physio for you Anna through to you know working in a sector that's around issue-based stuff Wayne how do we how do we start getting young people to consider careers where Sustrans as a schools officer is something that someone naturally chooses, doesn't find their way as a circuitous route to? So maybe start with Anna with that one. Yeah, I, th- I think the, the conversation with Natalie earlier, you know, just starting to talk to children about sort of environmental issues and about they how they can impact upon those if we start at that age and, and that understanding and then build that up through the school years. Um, and, you know, it's going to be something that becomes more sort of, you know, prevalent in our in a sort of job market, I guess, with sort of the ideas of energy, perhaps, and transport and things. So hopefully that will trickle through to, to secondary schools and colleges and the understanding of that there is a there's a great sort of options for, for jobs out there in a, a sector where you can make a real difference. Um, so, I th- yeah, I think that's where I'd start. Mel? Um, well, I think I think what's important for young people when they're thinking about their futures is, is that they often look at who's around them that's inspiring. Um, and that's why lots of 
children want to be teachers or famous people or those sorts of things so I guess it's our job to be inspiring um so <laughs> to to to, to show that our, you know that our job is fun uh, that we're making a positive impact and to share that with with young people um and I guess that that's what we need to see across the environmental sector um and and also just to share the different sorts of impacts that we do make um because that's what children that's what everybody wants at the end of the day isn't it they want to do something that makes a difference and that has an impact and whether that's about influencing others in a positive way or influence you know having a positive impact on the local or the international environment or um justice you know for, for others um i guess yeah we, we need to talk about those things and, and model those things i think being a good role model is, is key that's really that's really interesting points from both of you there actually particularly what you just said there mel now now wayne before i get you to answer um do you, are you involved in the recruitment of staff as well me yeah yes yeah yeah, I uh, interview all the team. Excellent. Uh, so what I'm saying is, yeah. so therefore, you're getting to see people come through and see where they are in their career when they've made the decision to approach us strands for employment. I mean, from, from your perspective, are you getting people that are starting out early in their career, um, you know, after A-levels or um, you know, graduating from university as a career choice, or is it always people that have done multiple other things in various sectors? This last, this last two years has been a, a, a good mix actually uh people come in uh, from graduates and through to uh yeah people that's got a lot of experience and worked in so we tend to get a lot of people that's worked uh, for these kind of jobs in the educational sector before in some way either as a teacher teaching assistant or part uh, some way connected to a school um we also yeah we, we get people that generally ha come from having the the environment and being conscious about the environment and it's their way of life that's where the people that come in to make good officers are really conscious of it all uh, and what it all means about what you was all talking about earlier about air quality and health and everything like that so yeah we, we do get a good a good range of people coming through now yeah it's really interesting because we're going to move on to our next section there and we were talking to um, we were lucky to, to talk to after I messed up the first interview we had to do a second one which I think was much better so but I would say that wouldn't I with um, Janet Dyer from Leicester City Council who is a transport development officer and, uh, and, and, and unsurprisingly I guess the very first question I asked her was well, what is a transport development officer so let's let's see what um, Janet had to say on that basis. Does a transport development officer do? Well, there are quite a lot of transport development officers at the City Council and they all do slightly different things, but obviously to do with transport and developing it uh, to make it more sustainable in Leicester. Um, what I do particularly is uh, I'm working with the walking and cycling team. So it's, uh, it's about, uh, I get involved in traffic calming projects, um, residential personal travel planning where we go and knock on people's doors and ask them how they're traveling and is there ways that they could be doing it differently and maybe suggest different things that they could try um uh, also uh we do lots of community events in our team so I kind of get involved in trying to work out what community events we're going to put on and where they'll be how big they are who's going because we, we work with lots of different partners so that who, who are those partners can come along on that day and, and help support that event um, and I also do travel grants for businesses. So there's a whole load of stuff going on there because um, the walking and cycling team, we have um, funding coming in from different sources and we have like three strands to our, the work that we do. We, do, we have a, a business strand, a school strand and a community strand. So we kind of have people working on all those different aspects. I wonder actually if whether anybody's aware of that. I, do, I just think that's the thing that's always been so fascinating doing what I do and, you know, knowing lots of different people like Mel and Anna, when you find out what people get up to do in their, in their work roles, you know, whether it's for the city council or for a local charity or, or even a business to, to an extent that all of this stuff that goes on. And of course, none of it is probably of interest to the mainstream media for educating other people. And so until you come across that project or you knock on my door and I suddenly find out that these, these, ways that you can help me to be to be active and particularly the fact that maybe with businesses i'm assuming businesses is that kind of you know access to grants for things like e-bikes and all, all, all these kind of things we do do that yes um but also we can 
arrange a, tra- uh, a staff travel roadshow where you know, people come in and like find out about how they can buy discounted bus passes and all this this sort of thing. Um, maybe they might want to purchase a bike, and there's there's ways you can purchase a bike with like through a salary sacrifice scheme and that sort of thing. Which obviously, you know, until somebody tells you, you maybe won't realise that you know, there's different ways you can go about these things. Absolutely, it's, it's about the information, isn't it? But you, yeah. you can only do it when someone either tells you or you've accessed the information. Yeah. So, so can I ask you, how do you how do you know these two ladies? These, and, these two ladies, they, they work they're next to me on they, the screen. They, they work for Sustrans, which is one of our partner organisations. So, you know, they're they're an uh, integral part of our uh, organisation. Um, they would normally be all sitting in the office with us, but you know, we're all working from home and enjoying ourselves. <laughs> on zoom calls and things like that but we do occasionally meet up out and about out outside of school perhaps you know to we have um, spent a lot of time getting the schools back safely uh in the last sort of uh, year or so so on, on two occasions anna's just been out again recently to to make sure they're all going back safely and you know things are running smoothly outside and again most of the time people don't realize a bit like that information is the fact that there's collaboration going on with organisations that are, you know, experts and knowledgeable in delivering these kind of projects or, you know, kind of access and stuff like that. I mean, is, is, is Sustrans one of those integral partners that actually aid the City Council to be able to do so much more than it would if it was just an, an internal uh, position? We feel that is the case because they, they bring a lot, they have a whole national structure and obviously they bring um, knowledge from other other cities and towns where they're working with other people so that they can kind of bring that knowledge from their organization in into the city council so you know that helps us so that other people at Sustrans are working in different cities and towns around the place and they may be at a different stage in certain projects to us so they might be able to say oh well when we did that such and such happened maybe you should do it this way instead <laughs> It was great, great chatting to Janet because you really kind of get behind not even the headlines. The trouble is the headlines aren't even interested, are they, in that kind of that kind of role? And the, the partners, you know, Sustrans and many other partners, I'm sure that the City Council engages with when it comes to service delivery. People just see the City Council and assume everybody's assume assumes the same. I mean, Wayne, is it um, do you have? Do you, do you have to really work to get good relationships with local authorities in the areas that you work? Or do you think that it's, it's a natural relationship, it's a natural synergy that you have because of you're trying to both move in the same direction? It depends on, on which council it is. In, I mean, we've been, we've been working with Leicester for, I think it's 14, 15 years, isn't it, Anna? Um, Anna's one of our, actual, for Sustrans, one of our longest serving uh, schools officers but we've had behave we, obviously we work with behavior change projects we work with people to actually get them to uh, think about their options think about their travel but we've got the infrastructure side where we actually build things we look after the national cycle network as well and there's so many different ways that we support councils uh, whether it's the local authority whether it's the borough councils we work with them in different ways and that relationship builds up once they've seen what we do uh, that relationship does then start to get to a point where it snowballs and more people are aware of it and it just keeps going and keeps going, which is really good. But you do, we do have to work hard. It's uh, uh, with all local authorities because a lot of the, a lot of people in uh, that's been working in this sector for so long have been, they've had to work in a certain way. They've been told they've got to work in and they've got to build roads for cars and they've got to build cities around cars and things like that and that's the way the political leadership has gone now it's different if you get the right leadership whether it's in the school like we saw earlier with jason and we, and we saw with, with natalie if all the way up to the city mayor uh, and the councillors uh, and the, the team leaders in leicester city council and people like janet there who are leading the way and actually making these things happen it, it just that's when our relationship works well with them. We can support them with different things. And yeah, it is that two way thing that we can bring extra bits, but we learn from them as well. So yeah, it is, it's a continuous growth, I think. Yeah, I, I suppose we were talking about the media earlier. I said, we'll mention the media at various points. I mean, um, maybe um, maybe bring Mel in here as well, kind of wider, wider environmental uh, perspective. There's always that perception, isn't it? Someone will read the paper or they'll see something in the news and they'll go, oh, you know, Leicester's got loads of money for more bike lanes and they've got more money for like, you know, doing a part of the city and stuff. And there's no, 
real understanding that that isn't necessarily coming out of your your council tax it's about Leicester trying to build relationships with people and identify different funding and stuff do you, do you think there's more that could be done Mel to educate people about you know some of the bigger stuff I mean I'm not saying everybody should be knowledgeable about what a transport development officer does but they should certainly be interested in what maybe Leicester's transport development plan is maybe you know I think it's helpful to know a little bit more about how decisions are made and, and how budgets get spent and there's a there's a couple of things about that I mean one is that funding is often very I mean I think Wayne and Anna will know this better than me but um very specifically ring fenced so often money that is for cycle lanes is money that has been given to the council for cycle lanes um, and it's not money that could be spent on something different um, so I think it's really helpful if people have you know if there are ways that people can get a better understanding about how decisions are made and the council just it, it sort of feels like yeah council has one pot of money and can do whatever it likes with it but I don't believe that isn't quite the reality so so that can be helpful to understand and then I think there's also maybe a shift in culture needed which I think is quite interesting with things like the citizens assemblies um, that have been talked about but a lot more recently which is where instead of saying, you know, instead of suggesting to people that you can have, th there's this possibility or not, it, it's really we need to be saying, well, we all need to achieve um, net zero, we all need to achieve um, carbon neutrality if we're going to save our wonderful planet and make it livable for our children and our next generations. Here are some of the options about how we do it. And these are the decisions we're made. We don't, we don't have a, we don't have a, an option of not doing that unless you know unless we want calamity so it's about how you, how you frame things really and, and helping people to understand given the fact that we need to massively reduce air pollution to save lives of children and, and adults in Leicester given the fact that we need to address the climate emergency we are looking at these different things and we have to make some decisions you know based on that and and I think taking that approach and helping the general public to understand decisions in that kind of a context is a different thing to just going do you want this or not it's not quite like that that's brilliant thank you that's a great overview and i thought that's why I was, it was great that even though you're relatively new to sus trends and you know your, your role as a school officer and, and, and anna as we just heard from wayne there being one of the longest if not the longest serving you've got a bit of a broader perspective on the environment and holistic stuff so that was brilliant you did exactly what you were brought in to do there well well done <laughs> um Anna from your perspective you obviously you know having worked for such transfer for for all those years you, you've got to build relationships and know people from other organizations as well you know like things like British Cycling is very, very proactive isn't it the city council has its own staff as well choose how you move which I know uh, Janet Dyer was she mentioned that as well didn't we you've kind of got to be aware of what's going on around you as a new to uh, avenue to kind of not only fit in but actually to be able to influence and, and, and yeah. bring that knowledge to the table yeah I, th I think in Leicester really good at communicating with each other all the different partners you know and we we meet very regularly even this year when it's been you know, really difficult to meet in person we've, we've made sure those meetings continue we talk through sort of what areas we're working in if there's there's room for collaboration we do that as well um, I think as long as you're doing that, then there's not going to be any of this kind of stepping on, on toes kind of thing because you, you're, you're working towards the same goal. And uh, as long as you're talking about it and involving each other and understanding that it, it works really well. And, you know, I hear of different things in other cities where it's perhaps not working so well. But I think that's one of the biggest things we should be proud of in this city is that the collaboration is really good. Cool. That's a good point. Um, so let's move on to the next bit that um, Janet said, because I kind of pressed her a little bit about... Um, not only being an employee of the city council but the role of the city council beyond being the local authority you know its role as a as an employer if you like and, and how it can influence other people so let's listen to that let's listen to that clip sort of you know the city council as an employer for example at this moment because it's easy for someone to turn around and say oh the city council should put cycling in they should put better walking things in all the you know that, that kind of responsibility if you like as an authority but obviously you work for the city council they are your employer and um, are they um 
as accommodating to you as an employee as they are to the messages that they send out to other people? I'm assuming that is the case, but I mean, are there specific things that you can access as well, like to be able to get bikes and stuff? Yeah, there are, there's a, um, a cycle to work scheme, so you can go and get a, a bike on a salary sacrifice if you want to. Um, we have uh, bike parking for the uh, city council employees at most of the buildings. If they haven't got them now, then they'll probably be planning to try and get some in the future. Um, what else? Uh, uh, yeah, there, there's other, you can get like um, discounted bus tickets and things like that as well. Um, and also they, we do do like a, an in-house um, staff travel roadshow so that all that information is sort of uh, available to people and we, we bring in a doctor bike in that as well generally. So if you've got problems with your bike, you can come and get it sorted out. Uh, that's all for like city council staff. And and as, as an employer, I'm not sure how big they are when it comes to the sort of the top 10 employers in the city, but obviously they've got a, a, a great way of promoting what an employer can do for their employees when it comes to this kind of active travel agenda by telling people what they do. I mean, do you, do you get involved in things for other employers as well to tell them about the schemes that are available, not just focusing on the public, but actually on, on employers as well? We do engage with businesses and so we take out a, a staff travel roadshow if, uh, if that's what the business would like us to do. And we've certainly worked with um, big universities and hospitals to do that sort of thing. And um, so, yeah, we've taken doctor bikes and things like that to the hospitals. Interesting. I put her on the spot a little bit there. <laughs> I like the way she was looking off like that. What else do we get offered? I'm sure there's loads, bless her. But I thought that was quite interesting. I mean, Wayne, you do a lot of work, obviously, said across the region with other cities and stuff like that. Do you do you find employers like some? I mean, I'm talking about some of the larger employers now. Come come direct to you for support and advice when it comes to this kind of stuff. Um, sometimes, uh, but to be honest, a lot of our work uh, with workplaces is through the councils and through the partnership working which is the best way I think to do it and it's how we've produced our our service our products as such so working closely uh, with Leicester and looking at the different employers the big employers and obviously the, the they've worked really well to get some of the, the big companies back in the city centre to, to make that uh, a more sustainable way and make it more accessible for people so they've not got to travel by bus to the uh, it, business estates on the outskirts of the city so we work with them and then we can go in and we do personal travel plans we can do journey buddies and all sorts of things like that and it's the same in Nottingham and Derby there's so many businesses out there Derby for example Rolls Royce massive different levels different departments doing different things uh, but yeah we can work with them and we on the very basic things as what's been said as a doctor bike just going in helping people look after the bike because people don't know through to that personal travel planning through to looking at the company-wide infrastructure um, and uh, where look transports between the different sites using cargo bikes using electric bikes themselves and getting their own fleet of, of kit like that so the, the partnership working is definitely the best way with, with the city councils and uh, yeah all little other organizations that you've already mentioned that are already out there yeah interesting point that i mean i mean mel do you i mean you're, you're, you know being reasonably new to the such trends as well were, were, were some of these employee benefits if you like or some of the things that janet was talking about there are, are they conscious things that you would look for when you when you were looking for additional work and stuff um yeah i mean i guess for me what's really important is that i am able to travel actively through work and um to my workplace and around for my workplace and that's always a really key thing and of course luckily sustrans walks the talk so um so it's a perfect organization to work for if you want to be able to um, to travel actively and not to have to have your own personal car so that that's um, that's a massive issue and a massive benefit benefit for me um, I thought it might be worth mentioning actually that the that um, we're talking about here business engagement and it just so happens that there's just the eco schools folk are uh, with the business engagement people at Leicester City Council today I think have invited schools to take part in a sort of a joint project where um, schools can have school teachers uh, up to six school teachers can have access to e-bikes for a certain period of time um, to have a go on them to try their route to, to and from school um, on them and really importantly to use that to talk to the young people 
in school about what it's like to try and change your travel journey and what it's like to try and um, increase your active travel and, and, and what it's like to, to, to sort of change how you, you travel to work or to school. So that's, um, that's just a little link in there from Janet's interview. Yeah, that's brilliant. I mean, that's really good, isn't it? Because again, it's, you're back to, it's not how much you do, it's the fact you do something. You know what I mean? And then the something that you do, just think about, does it make a difference? You know, could it be built on? You know, I think this is one of the things that's been great working with you, Mel, and, and Anna on the, on the um, International Women's Day newsroom specifically. And people will be able to find the links to, to that on both your Sustrans website uh, uh, and Facebook pages, as well as the Dot Media Centres, is the fact that all of these people were doing it for their own personal reason. You know what I mean? And it wasn't about giving up cars. It was about you can have a car, but you can cycle two or three days a week. I don't think there was any teacher that was there cycling full time, um, as in five days a week. Um, yeah. I think I think Charlotte was. <laughs> I'm fairly sure Charlotte does. I think she works three days a week though. So yeah, she works. Oh, good point. She was cycles for the days that she was at the school, but there wasn't a teacher that for the five days was. They were doing sort of you know two or three days, you know, changing it around weather on a Friday and a Monday, so they didn't have to take work home and laptops. And I think that's what it's about. It's about everybody being able to accommodate their own lifestyle and, and journey into it. And I think that's one of the things that's really, really key. So fi final uh, question to you, Anna, on this section before we move on, is if you were to um, talk to someone, like one of my students that was graduating, you know, this year, and an opportunity came up between, you know, working, not so working so much for Sustrans, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but, you know, working for a, 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 an organisation that was interested in the environment. What kind of top things would you say they should be looking for? Um, I guess sort of a, an understanding of, of how your work fits into a bigger picture. You know, that the thing we're talking about earlier, making an impact, I think if you can leave a day's work and feel good that you've, you've done something, you've contributed in any way, I think that's that's great. Um, yeah, and I think just just give it a try. You know, I, I've stayed in this organisation for as long as I have because I, I enjoy my daily work. I love the impact. I love if you like people, you know, if you want to be chatting to people, helping people, it's a, it's a good profession to go into. Um, and as I think Wayne mentioned, there's lots of different areas as well. You can look at the infrastructure side, you can look at the behaviour side, change side, there's community, the schools, workplaces. So it can be really varied as well. OK, great. So let's move on to the next section now. Um, this is quite interesting, actually. I'm, I'm fascinated by this because uh, I think the big the big pedal's great. I do love that. Like I said, that logo and that website. How it go, you can go back and change, and it's like more schools, more kids. It's going to be excellent. Um, is this helmet, hijab, and hair competition? So what we're going to do? Right, let, me, let me show let me show the little or a little section of the film, and then I'll come back and talk to you because I just think it's a really great way of getting people to think about it very differently. We need your help to inspire and give confidence to more young women who want to cycle. By helping out, you can win vouchers for hairdressing or cycling equipment. It's simple to enter. All you need to do is create one or more hairstyles or hijab designs, which will work well with a cycle helmet. You can draw your design or create and take photos with and without a cycle helmet. You can take the International Women's Day, choose to challenge, pose with it too. Tell us why you design the hairstyle and how it works with a cycle helmet. Either write it down or make a short video to go with your pictures. Send your entries to mail.board at sustrans.org.uk. If you're under 18, please send them via a trusted adult, like a school teacher, parent, carer, or youth worker. I'll, I'll stop it there. It goes on, it goes on a little bit longer, but hey. Mel, we introduced you beautifully by giving your email address, so we'll come to you. So tell us a little bit more about the project. Well, first of all, I'd just like to say that that we wouldn't got to see though, that hadn't been for Wayne, whose technical know-how made that possible, because um, I haven't got a clue how to make an animation film like that. So thank you to Wayne for knowing, knowing his stuff on that one. 
Um, so yeah, so the project, um, it came out of a, a conversation, if, you, if you've seen the International Women's Day newsroom, you might know this already, but it came out of a conversation um, with a young woman that I volunteer with actually. Um, I first met her over Zoom, I was doing some teaching with her um, through an organisation called After 18. She'd have a different hairstyle every single time I met her on Zoom, like something amazing and fantastic, like beautifully managed. And then I met her in person and she arrived on her bike, which I was super excited about um, because I work for Sauce Trans and I, and I love it when people cycle. And um, so I got chatting to her about that and she was saying, I hate wearing my helmet. Um, but my, my foster mum says, I must wear my helmet. And I know she's right because it's much better for my safety. Um, and we carried on chatting and as a schools officer, I was kind of keen to know, does she ever cycle to college? And she went to college. <laughs> um, so she, she, she hadn't thought about cycling to college. And, and uh, the reasons we talked about, one was sort of storage, where would I put my helmet and things like that. But also about, so she, she, wore, a, quite, she wore quite a simple hairstyle with her helmet. And she likes, you know, when she goes to college to, to look really, really stylish. So this is where the idea for the competition came from. It's like, well, let's, why don't we be creative about it? If this is a barrier, and I've been reading about um, barriers, particularly for secondary age school, um, young people and girls particularly. Um, and I'd seen that people talk about image being a particular issue um, and peer pressure and what will the boys say and those kinds of things. Um, and so I put together this suggestion that we have this, this competition which kind of raise awareness of some of the barriers for young women particularly and have a sort of fun way of being creative um, and giving young people an opportunity to, to just be creative, yeah, with, with, their, with their hairstyles and their hijab styles um, and, and kind of envisage wearing a helmet. So if they don't cycle or they, or they wouldn't cycle without wearing a helmet, then just have that sort of imaginary what would it what would I look like if I was wearing a cycle helmet and that's part that's really the idea behind it that's what I liked about it it was a competition but it was also aspirational as well because it was an opportunity to um get people to really think about you know what they could be doing going forward you know it's really kind of getting them to to um maybe anticipate how they could change their lifestyle it wasn't just about what you wore it was also about um, you know, uh, the, how, you, how you wore your hair and stuff like that. It's really interesting. I mean, Anna, from, from your perspective, this is almost like something that you could use as a tool as well, isn't it? As a, as a school yeah. officer, but also as a parent to talk to people, maybe parents from other, from other backgrounds as well, um, faiths or other, other countries that you see in the playground. So have you thought about this? This is really interesting. Yeah. Your child is the connection with the bike, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think one of the one of the sort of sad things is often girls at primary school cycle sort of similar levels as boys. And then when you get to the secondary school, the, the girls cycle level just drops. Um, and I think there's loads of different factors, but I think just having these conversations, you know, it's, it's one aspect, the sort of hair, helmet, hijab is one aspect. But, you know, it's one aspect to start with, because if that's an issue for, for people, we need to be discussing it. Um, so it'd be really, it'd be really interesting. Mel and I have talked about this. If, if following a group of, of girls at say year six of primary school who were cycling at the moment, and supporting them as they go to secondary school and keeping that connection, um, it'd be interesting to see if we can do. It. I'd love to try it, <laughs> um, and just to, to follow through, add that support, and hopefully that means I'll continue to use a bike into secondary school. That's interesting. You make an interesting point there, don't you, as well about that group of young people that are, you know, in year six. We talk about transitioning to secondary school, um, but we don't also think about staying connected with, with mm -hmm. young people as well, almost to give them the confidence to continue with that transition. You mm. know, it's not just the transition between two buildings and two organisations around your schooling. It's actually the transition of everything else, isn't it? It's being it's much more adult-like, open to other people from yeah. different areas and stuff. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if I, a long way ago, but if I think back to sort of teenage years, it's a, it's a difficult time, isn't it? Because you're you're trying to sort of maybe find out who you think you are, but then you're trying to fit in with different social groups and perceptions of who you should be. So you've got all that going on and now sort of dropping the maybe added sort of pressures of, of social media as well for some people. You know, it's a, it's a tough time. And I think if we could find a way of, of trialing that and supporting a group through that transition and continuing, that'd be lovely. Yeah, I reckon there's a real, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of learning in there actually that could in, impact 
lots of different things when it comes to how we look at children and, and young people, particularly as they become become adults. So Wayne, just bringing you in there, because Mel mentioned about um, the, the animation and stuff like that and the, the idea and the support and the kind of that, that you've given it. Do you think it's a really important way of doing something that's slightly different, that's quite inclusive, that can also be using, you know, maybe social media? Yeah, definitely. It's um, it. There's so many barriers for people and and young ladies. The barriers that you, we, there's a lot of them. This project is just concentrating on one of them, um, and that's why doing something that little bit different, trying to promote that, can overcome that that first barrier. Because we can't we can't get everyone cycling right away and, and just solve all the problems. Just we need to take one step at a time. And this is one way to do it. Using that on social media, the videos, reaching out to uh, people, the younger people is what we want to do. I'm not a young person. I'm not necessarily the best at that. But so but by listening and getting that feedback, this is what we're trying to do. What you, like you were talking about earlier, how do we track the right people in? And we've got to do it by listening to them, finding out what they want and then opening up the doors and say, come on, come in and tell us what you want, tell us how to do. It. And that's what we're trying to do with this kind of uh, project. Excellent. So just final word on this one, uh, back to Mel. Um, how long is that competition open for? It's open until the end of March. So it's still got a good week to send in your entries. Um, and it's been really lovely seeing the variety of different types of entries. Um, I didn't ex realize how, what a variety of the ways, I love the way that young people interpret the competition. So we've had all sorts of different interesting ways that they've sent in their entries so far. And you shared some of those with me and, and, and Tina has put some of those on social media today as well. So they're on Twitter and, and Facebook. So you can look at them for some inspiration for your own inspiration as well. So that, that's quite good. So let's move on to our, our final school now, which was Granby um, Primary School. And we, we were very lucky to speak to um, Jane Swift. I think Jane was the deputy head. Is that right? Yes, right. Okay, good. I got that right. I, call, I did call Jason the head teacher. I promoted him. I waved my hand and promoted him when we did the interview. So that was quite funny. And she starts off talking to a little bit about the summer cycle ride, um, which has become a bit sort of legendary uh, down there. That was fascinating. So we'll, we'll share that screen now and hopefully people find this interesting. Community event. So it started, I don't know how many years ago, actually, probably I can remember doing probably eight or nine years now. And our previous head, Peter Fowler, set it up. It was his idea. And the idea was that um, children and their families can start a bike ride at Granby, cycle down the Great Central Way, go to the park um, at the end of it, going in towards town, um, and then cycle back again. And then when the children get back to school, they can have um, a barbecue. And so some staff are along the route and some staff are at the park at the bottom and some staff are cycling as well with children um, and parents who are encouraged to join in. And then um, some staff are back at school preparing the barbecue and then they all come back and have a big barbecue. Usually it's really, really hot and sunny. I don't think it's been rained off at all, actually. Um, so it is quite a big event. And um, Peter Fowler, our previous head, um, always championed cycling. It was really important to him. And I think the school have just kept that tradition going. Um, so we haven't been able to do it, obviously, because of COVID. So, so we've had a, a year out of doing it. Um, and some of the children scooter as well and we try and get all the sort of young children involved with parents but it's, it's become quite a big community event um, and it's really yeah, good it's fun. interesting because being able to catch up for this newsroom and also the newsroom for International Women's Day the Sustrans newsroom we did with, in partnership with Mel and Anna it's interesting talking to teachers and particularly head teachers and you yourself being a, a deputy there's that kind of role model to your staff well as to the pupils and I think also being able to take parents and, and governors even schools have been talking about closing streets yesterday and having the neighbours involved it really is you've got to take everybody on that journey not just teach young people to to bike ride what do you think is one of the most positive things that comes out of those events that you've seen over the years for the school I think I just think the families being involved in it and, and the school being part of the community and you know, being a community event, but the governors are involved, the governors come along on the bike ride, the governors can help with barbecue, and just having all of that school community there, but also seeing families cycling together and enjoying it. And in fact, our IT technician came with um, 
some old sort of CDs he'd found with pictures on the other day. And one of them was of one of the old cycle rides. And I sort of put them on my computer and had a look through them and just seeing some of our families from the past and thinking of past pupils and past families and looking at these little smiley, happy faces cycling past and thinking that, you know, you sort of started a tradition, but hopefully got more families out cycling together and enjoying some time together. Yeah. So Anna, just bringing you in here. There you go. I was, I was a second over there. I apologise. So I will bring you in, Anna, just to make sure that they, I segued into that beautifully. Um, obviously, Granby is where your, your own daughter goes. It is, yeah. Is that right as well? So again, is, is this something you'll be participating in as a, do you, do you, wear, a, do you wear a sus trans yeah. jacket at the top and then you wear a parent helmet? I mean, how does it work when you participate? <laughs> this is a, my daughter's first year in school, so we'll see how that goes. But yeah, in, in the past, I've uh, supported the ride by being out and about, maybe at one of the crossings. Um, and it's, it's an amazing event considering it's led by a school. You know, lots of things happen where you have outside people going in to support. But when when you've got a school that takes it on themselves, they, they put up um, posters and labels along the route the week before to let people know there'll be a bike ride coming at that particular time on that day. You know, the, the organisation behind it is is amazing. And literally, you, know, you might have 300 people riding by at one point from one school, which is amazing to see. Um, and I, I really hope it will continue and yeah, whether we support it as Sustrans and I um, can't wait as a parent as well to get involved. Um, it's, it's just wonderful. It's great. And it is one of those things that parents talk about. You know, it's, it's kind of one of those events in the calendar that people look forward to. So, yeah, long may it continue. Yeah. I mean, Wayne, looking again um, with your uh, regional focus, is, is it... Is it a good feeling as someone who works for such trends when a, a school comes to you and says, we want to do our own? It's great when they go on the school's ride. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I, lo I love seeing it here in the city. I've, I've seen them light up some amazing spaces with them all cycling past and all the noise that comes with it. And, and the disruption is really good. Um, it's, it's part of me sort of slightly anarchistic when I see it, because I just think that's what it's about. It's only when young people take action like this, a bit like if older people all sat down in the middle of a street, you know, we've, we've got to start taking a little bit of a positive direct action to make some of these changes and the pandemic's done that for us. Is it a good thing when a school comes and says, look, you know, we want to do our own schools ride. Can you help us? Do you have resources available for that? Are you able to support them? Absolutely. Yeah, it's always good. And it happens. I mean, our programme, it's been designed specifically. So we work with the schools quite intensely to start with, basically hold their hand to show them what to do. The second stage as we go through, we step back a bit and it's that empowering, they've got the knowledge. And the third stage is really hands off, uh, sending them emails, give, when they give us a call, if there's an issue they need to sort out. And that's when we do see these schools take, take it on themselves. And when they do, it has that longer knock on effect as sort of things you've been saying we, we then see the the families out cycling we see the children out uh, uh riding and when the, we get involved with the council events such as like for example a year or so ago there was regularly doing uh, open streets event in in the city center on a sunday morning and we'd be there and the children would come up and talk to us and they've cycled there with their family and the family had talked to us and said us it's because of things like these bike rides that they all got back on their bikes again and they're back out there and they're doing things and they're sharing their stories in their community and it does have that knock-on effect and we also see them at the events that Anna mentioned earlier the uh, pop-up events in the parks that we do over the summers as well um, and so linking that in with the schools yeah when those schools say yes we want to do it we've got the resources we've got the templates we've got the we can help them plan the routes even if we're not working intensely with the school we can help them uh, show them what's available particularly in Leicester there's so many great cycle routes we can do the great central way straight down the middle but it's access is so many different things so many different parks so many different like na uh, natural nature areas and everything as well so yeah i yeah i love it <laughs> when the schools come and ask and say yeah we want to go for this and it's the same in, in any project and when they do it and we stand back the it's slightly alarming we can't we can't run it when there's 300 people because our our rides that we lead are educational rides taking people to that next level showing them what to do 300 people is beyond uh, what we would do um but it's not about what that it's about them saying yes we're going to go out we're going to have fun it's the parents leading this it's the schools leading this it's listening to the children which is what we've always got to do with this looking at things through their eyes what they want to do and our job is to empower that and help make it happen yeah i think that's been one of the great things about these two newsrooms is listening to people 
coming at it from that holistic approach where it's not just about the children cycling and doing their level two and the schools ride. It's about, you know, governors, people that work in the schools, you know, the caretaker, the neighbours, everybody going on this journey that we've all got a role to play when it comes to, to changing it. I mean, uh, Mel, just bringing you on this in on this conversation as well as, as, as someone who was a secondary school teacher, for example, um, we tend to find that a lot of this really good, fun, interesting stuff that's done at primary school tends to disappear when we become uh, in, into, into secondary school and it all gets a little bit serious when someone comes to you at 13 and 14 and says, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? And pick your GCSEs and it all starts getting a little bit more serious, isn't it? Um, do you, what kind of impact do you think something like these kind of programs that we have see here and been talking about in, in primary schools are available in secondary schools? I'm not saying I don't know that they are or they're not. I'm just thinking of, you know, the work that Tina and I have done, for example, in secondary schools, you very rarely see any projects like that. It tends to be around mental health and photography. We're working with Fullhurst on a project like that, you know, so the, is, would you see that as an important thing as a, as a former secondary school teacher? Yeah, so um, I know that in Leicester there has been work done with um, several secondary schools in the past and also we've been discussing regionally actually um, with Wayne and Anna and lots of our other colleagues about um, the fact that there is more currently available for primaries than there are for secondaries and there is a tendency to work more with primaries than there is with secondaries and there are lots of reasons for that um, and one of those is, is the sort of structures of secondaries versus primaries so that things tend to be very much more boxed off in secondaries um, and so um, for example if, if we're doing a campaign in primaries it's much easier for it to become a whole school campaign very quickly whereas in a secondary school you might have to work on a subject by a subject basis um, and sort of access to students or taking students out of lessons or all sorts of things around that can just become more challenging in secondaries and as you say you know they've got more of an exam focus often um, and all of those sorts of things so but we I'm very passionate about um, about you know working across the range and I know Anna's already mentioned that we've been talking about an idea of maybe a transition project um, I know that Wayne has shared some things with me which are going on in um, Ireland and Scotland now there's a campaign called Anchi Cycles which works with secondary school young women, um, which is again, really combating those stereotypes about young women and cycling and really helping them break down the barriers of that. So I think there's a lot of enthusiasm. Um, I think there, there, we've definitely got existing things, we've got existing resources and existing things. And we also have this aspiration, I think, to, to up what we're doing um, with that age group. And because there's that sort of understanding that you often get this brilliant uptake at primary, um, and then sort of adult uptake and you've got this sort of gap in the middle. Um, and it's great because the once you've got the foundation in primary, you're more likely to take it up as an adult again. But wouldn't it be great to think about all the independence advantages that Anna talked about personally for herself, you know, as a teenager to, for, for children to have, have those experiences much more at that age. Yeah, and certainly working at, at the university, sometimes I feel when I have conversations either with individual students or that with them as a group and I get them to relax and, it, and trust me and they're very honest is that, that, that there's a, sometimes a, a real yawning gap between primary school activity and what I'm encouraging them to do with media production and communication arts at DMU and so in the interceding period has been has been GCSEs <laughs> and A-levels or BTEC and stuff and sometimes it's about learning things to pass things rather than being creative so I mean maybe that's a, that's a bigger conversation but I'm, I'm glad I asked that question and it was great that we managed to touch on that so we've got two, two as well just um, Sorry, just, well. I just want to say with the secondary schools on some of our projects it's like it's about uh, being able to just be that more creative in our thinking and taking it to the school so like as an example project we had in we we're just restarting in Lincoln but the project we had in Lincoln a few years ago won some national awards and it was about active travel and linking with the A-level students uh, around photography. And they weren't, um, they was out. They were planning their routes from the school by bike to the train station. They went on the train to Skegness, came back, they took the photos. And, and those, what by being able to do that, it was, we weren't talking about cycling, we weren't talking about trains, we were talking about their A-level work. And they, two of the, I believe two of the children um, they got commissioned by the trains, uh, train company. And now if you go on the poacher line train from Nottingham to 
it's getting less ed plays are there. They are actually performing those A-level students, and those A-level students were able to put that in their portfolio, the application. Yeah. The so, other options, we've got local uh, in Derby, we've got the velodrome. So we can uh, and we, we can look at doing sort of cycling as part of women, uh, girls PE or boys PE and get them to go from Leicester to the train to Derby into the velodrome, do part of that and then come back through the GCSE. So this, that's what our officers bring to that and linking it all up with the active travel. It's not just about yeah getting on your bike, as you were saying earlier. Yeah, maybe we could do a separate active travel newsroom that specifically focuses on secondary school or college stuff. Yeah. Quite interesting. Like I said, you know, the fact that you're combined, we've, we've done, you know, mental health projects and wellbeing projects using photography were fullest. So suddenly if that was included with an active travel element, um, you know, it'd be quite interesting. Yeah, so maybe maybe we can explore that over the over the coming months. So let me let me just go on to the final two things for, for today's newsroom before we run out of time. Um, now, I never realised, but there's an active travel week, okay? And, and uh, it was in December last year when it was incredibly cold. And, and, and Jane was sharing um, some stuff with us about that. So let's have a quick listen and then we can, we can touch base on what, what she says here. Well, it was really good fun, actually, because obviously we've not been back that long after COVID. And I think we were planning to do it a little bit earlier and then it got moved because there were quite a lot of things happening in school. And what we really wanted to do was do some events, do some fun activities for the kids, because obviously there's no trips. You know, there's no other events really happening in school, not many visitors coming in school. So actually quite a lot of the learning was classroom based. And so it was sort of really good to have a few different activities going on for the children to invest in and get excited about. And just sort of make it a bit more interesting than sat in the class just doing the lessons every day and so it was a really good week to celebrate how we travel into school and we've been using our bike shelter um from september so we had had the bike shelter still still in use um, and the children park their bikes and scooters in there every day um it was just a really fun week the children like receiving the raffle tickets every day um so if they biked or scooted or walked to school they got a raffle ticket and they really look forward to that we did lots of activities during the week about sort of bikes the parts of bikes repairing bikes um watched um sort of clips and um information that have been sent to us by sustrans they were really useful in providing the resources for us and then on the friday we had a be bright and seen day which was really good actually because it was starting to get dark you know it was dark in december it was dark in the morning still and so it was really nice to see them come in on that day in really, really bright fluorescent clothes or just bright, colourful clothes. Um, and then we just had a, a, an assembly celebration um, that was led by Sus Trans for us. Uh, and it, it was just a really fun day. Um, and the children love travelling to school, either by walking or cycling or scootering. You know, they really do enjoy coming into school that way. Um, any children that tended to come by car, we talked about parking a few streets away and then just sort of walk in the last bit and then they still got um, a, a, a raffle ticket so they didn't feel that they'd missed out um, but it was a really good week about talking about road safety as well um, and just helped us talk on the Friday about why it is really important to be bright and be seen um, and then we, we ran a competition throughout the week as well and such trans provided prizes for that as well. Um, so sounded really good fun actually I feel like I've missed out that week that sounded like there was little, especially stickers and badges and all sorts of stuff and this is I guess um Anna is really important isn't it it's the it's the inclusion even those children that aren't able to participate because of the parents for example mm -hmm. then you've still got to you know park a few streets away and you can still get something it's not about having and not having isn't it it's we've got to be really careful about that as well yeah definitely I think those you know park and strides are something that the council are really pushing forwards because we understand that you know some parents might need to to drop the child off by car because they've then got to go on somewhere else um but that understanding if you just park that little bit further away from the school the benefits that that can bring you know, if it means that your child then gets a five minute walk that you're not polluting sort of the air around the immediate school. There's lots of benefits that way. So yeah, we, we need to be open-minded. We need to support people in lots of different ways. And a week like that can be really beneficial to a school. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, Mel, bringing you in here, it's really important that we take into account, isn't it, the lowest common denominator, as in the person that can't get a bike, the person that doesn't have access to the internet, the person that has got uh, maybe their religious beliefs or you know where they're from we, we've got to take into account all of those things when we when we start providing these services and opportunities for people to to get involved and I guess your helmet hijab and hair is probably I don't know whether it is or whether it is acknowledging for the first time 
that you know certain headwear or hairstyles will actually impact on you wearing a helmet is that is it was was that something that was behind your thought process as well as you was designing the competition um i haven't i can't tell you for absolute certain whether anyone has <laughs> has drawn attention to this before but um yeah definitely um i think also um, I've, I've been looking at things like, um, I don't know if you've heard of the Halo Collective that have been promoting, you know, really um, letting people know about the discrimination that a lot of people with Afro hair have experienced both in schools um, and historically in lots of different places and workplaces in the past. So that came up through our sort of equality, diversity and inclusion route in Sustrans and I was reading about that um, and thinking about, you know, how for a lot of people um, and you know, having curly hair myself as well, for some people, hair styling or have, if you wear a hijab, people get discrimination around that often, can be already quite a stressful thing to think about, right? And then if you're gonna add a helmet on top of that and, and maybe some different people's views about helmet wearing or what it look, you look like on a bike or things like that, all of that really did sort of resonate and so I was also reading about there's a natural hair day um, which is I think in September again to celebrate people with their natural hair and to, to sort of challenge these idea, ideas that, that hair has to be a certain way um, and so I did really want to make sure um, and the people I was working with that we already wanted to make sure that it was a really inclusive campaign and that people who don't often see themselves reflected in pictures of people cycling. Um, so people, you know, of African heritage, Caribbean heritage, Asian heritage, Middle Eastern heritage, who often don't see images of themselves when it comes to active travel, will, would be thinking about themselves in, in that way and be seeing that as, well, that could be me. I could be that person. Um, so, yeah. Excellent. That's a good bit of work, actually. I'm, I'm really impressed with that. That's been one of those things I think I'll keep an eye on as well. And and do a bit of research around because again I think that's going to be one of those resources that's going to be quite important if we did anything around active travel with secondary schools you know we're, we're going to come up against this fitting in societal barriers that are put up around inclusion and uh, you know being seen and that kind of stuff so that's great now listen I know we've got five minutes to go before Anna needs to disappear four minutes now good my clock clock just changed four minutes um to go and get the munchkin from Granby. So what we'll do is let me just do this last part. It's two minutes. It was great. You guys came up with this idea and, and hopefully people will enjoy the fact that we, uh, in a very nice way, we ambushed Jane with this little, uh, with this little, little section. we bring uh, the uh, conversation to a close but we've got something rather special for you so I'm going to hand over to Anna and Mel to ambush you shamelessly on this Zoom call. <laughs> Will you go first Mel? Um, sure um, yeah so we myself and Anna have been talking about just how Granby has stood out during this time in terms of your continuing commitment to active travel and your continued engagement with us and just the encouragement that the children have been getting to continue taking that sort of those healthy choices um, that's so good for their well-being in so many different ways. Um, so Anna came up with a with a brilliant idea of a prize, which maybe she can tell you about and introduce. Yeah, uh, yeah. So we hope this will be a, a fantastic prize for for Granby. We have an amazing colleague called Lee Timmis, who is a superstar adventurer. Uh, he cycled all around the world over seven years, and he is also a, a world record holder. So he's uh, he's got the current world record for cycling across Europe in sixteen days. And um, so he is an amazing talker and inspiring, and I think. The assembly that he'll be able to give to your your children, I think, will be uplifting and encourage more children to maybe just get out on the bike at the weekend and enjoy some of the things he talks about. Um, Mel and I had a little brief introduction of his talk, and it includes bears and moose and various other big animals. That I'm sure the children will love to hear about. Um, so yeah, so we just like to say thank you for being the way you are and inspiring to us, but inspiring to other schools as well. So thank you very much. Oh, can I just say thank you for all the support we get from Sustrans as well. We get lots of resources, lots of support. We know you're there for us to give us ideas and to give us prizes and to give us lots of things that we need to make it work and make it possible. 
and make it fun for the children. So thank you very much. Uh, Jane, congratulations. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, we've had uh, Lee has recorded a, a small uh, clip for you to play in the school as well. So I'll give you a, I'll give you a, a run through of that now, and then we'll share that with you, and you can actually play it to the children. Okay. So I'm just going to share oh, that screen now. Here we go. Hello everyone at Granby Primary and congratulations on being Sustrans Active Travel Superstars. My name is Lee Timmis and I'm a world record breaking cyclist and I've cycled around the world. And I'm your prize. Well, kind of. You don't get to keep me. But next month I'm going to visit you virtually to share some of my experiences and adventures from my years on the bike and to do some questions and answers with you. Congratulations again and I'm really looking forward to meeting you soon. Have you got the visions of like someone taking Lee home on their bikes? So that I mean, I've, I've won Lee for the for the weekend. I've got to take him home like the classroom pet. <laughs> it, Wayne, is this one of the uh, prerequisites when you're interviewing people? They've got to have a good sense of humour. Oh, Woody, might, yeah, <laughs> they, they need a good sense of humour. It, yeah, it's just we do just have some amazing members of staff, amazing people in the team on all our teams, and yeah, Lee's a little bit of an exception, but talk to us. We've got members of staff that cycled around the coast of Britain. We've got uh, another member in our team that cycled from North to South America. Anna has cycled all sorts of places around the world and I know Mel's had some adventures as well but it's yeah it's just yeah it's the great bunch of people the great team and yeah they just lead by example and they really empower the kids that we're working with which is so so good. Brilliant okay so we've, we've come to the end of the newsroom um, so what I'll do is I'll give you all an opportunity to to say some final final thoughts maybe so Anna you can go first yeah if I go first then I might need to dash or I'll be getting told off by Granby yeah. um, just to say thank you John this has been such a brilliant experience and it's been it enabled us to keep in touch with lots of our schools as well and bring them along with this journey of doing the newsroom so yeah just just a big thank you to, to you and to Tina thank you good good, good. Say bye -bye. good fun yeah see you later bye, bye there we go Anna off to be active okay Mel um, yeah, just to echo that really, and just to say to Wayne, could we, well, one of the great things about doing this is like to, to think about how, what we've achieved and what the schools have achieved that we're working with. So instead of writing a report at the end of each quarter, can we just do another Trapful Newsroom with John? <laughs> Part of it, yeah, we'll, we'll go for it. We'll pitch that one, see how we get on. You should be asking me that, Wayne, not asking you permission for me to do it. Good grief. Yeah. I've, I've, just, I've just been ambushed there by Mel. That was rather good, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, we'll have a different theme each quarter. It'd be great. Just, just a little bit different, isn't it? So, I mean, Wayne, from your, from your, your perspective, I mean, just, just going forward, do you, do you think something like this is slightly different? I mean, you know, we've just put out, you know, congratulations to the school for winning that. And, and Tina's done a fantastic job of running this in real time alongside it with all the films and, and Twitter. And again, happy to share any of this content with your corporate communications colleagues. It's just, we've just got to try different ways, haven't we, of, of engaging employers and schools and, and parents and, and teachers. Absolutely. Part, part of the things you were talking about earlier is how do we how do we get people involved in this line of work? How do we get people involved in what we're doing? We did a little bit the two days leading up to International Women's Day. We we realised that um, equality and, and in our workforce is, is not always that great. And we, we put on lots of really, really inspirational videos from the women we work with from the city council uh, to our officers and across the whole region. They're all on our Facebook page telling us about their jobs a little bit like Janet was earlier. That's one way to do it in encouraging people. And this is another way, John, this is so valuable. And, and uh, yes, we go, I want us to look at the video. I want to see how we can work together, how we can share it and examples of how we can take forward and yeah put, plugging it into the secondary schools and, and showing the people the options that are out there for when they're thinking about their career choices yeah, it's such it, i believe this is going to be a really good resource yeah so thank you for your time no problem absolutely delighted to help i've, I've enjoyed it the experience of doing both of them has been great working with with mel and anna obviously yourself wayne and talking to all of the people that gave up their time at the end of busy school days and you know Janet having to do it twice because I messed up the first one you know we've, 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 all, we've all been on a journey I'm sure everybody's enjoyed, enjoyed this active travel newsroom so um, listen guys thanks very much for your time and uh, look forward to speaking to you in a couple of weeks time. Thanks John.